Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Karbala Reflections. I'm joined here today by Sister Amina and Sister Sara to discuss an important issue that we perhaps don't look into enough that we could learn through the events of Karbala. Today we would like to discuss loyalty and fidelity. Assalamu alaikum Sister Amina, Assalamu alaikum Sister Sara. Loyalty and fidelity is obviously a characteristic admired by all. Um, what do you think it's what do you think it means? being loyal or I think this is something that virtually all people have an intrinsic knowledge of at the very least we understand when someone is disloyal yeah. then the plates start flying <laughs> people are very angry about that sort of thing um, it doesn't really need any definition this is again one of those innate truths yeah um, the thing is I feel that sometimes people don't associate loyalty with consistency so for example you could face a situation in your life where you feel that you have someone very loyal to you um, you know you're, you're doing successful thing after successful thing and the person is with you however sometimes what happens is when you start facing difficulties or turmoils in your life you, f- you see people distance from around you distance themselves and How does that fit in with loyalty and being loyal? Um, I think that's what they call farewell friends, <laughs> something which you have when you know days are sunny and everybody can celebrate your achievements. But I think it's also important that um, I think that's a uh, generalization as well, because in many ways, some people, for example, won't celebrate other people's celebrations. Sometimes they, they won't be there for your happiness or some people enjoy seeing other people down. And there's hadith about all variations, I think, of that. Um, this perspective, um, Imam Ali Laysan, for example, says, don't, you know, don't look down on people. That is a huge part of arrogance as well, where sometimes someone is down and as a society, perhaps as an individual, um, it's very easy to kick someone down when they're down, you know? And I think literally on the day of Ashura that happened to Imam Hussein. So I think in terms of the variations of um, loyalty, it's um, the Holy Prophet peace upon him has so many hadiths about what it means to be a friend and how The definition of a friend is behind your back, you know, in, in your death, behind your back, when you aren't there, in your absence. And absence is a huge thing because in many ways, again, we can relate to our relationship with the 12th Imam, his so-called absence. How does it reflect our loyalty to him as a leader to us? Because we don't physically see him doesn't mean that we are actually loyal to him through our actions. So I think in terms of, you know, opening that discussion and It can be interpreted in so many ways, but again, it's something we all feel on such a personal level when it happens to us, but not necessarily reflecting on how, for example, our loyalty, how far it extends in its own essence. Yeah. I think she raised a very valid point that um, we've been lucky enough to have, we've been blessed to have many hadiths um, about friendship, but at the same time, alhamdulillah, we've been given some very good uh, narratives and stories um, from history about the definition of a good friend. Um, the first one that springs to mind, for example, is the story of John, Abu Dar's slave. And um, would you like to share the story with us? Well, Alhamdulillah, an example of someone who was loyal to Ahlulayt, peace be upon them. Uh, we know that he was quite elderly and the Imam encouraged him to leave rather than suffer and be killed. in Karbala, but nonetheless he stood for Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, and gave his life. Uh, that is definitely a very beautiful example of loyalty. Uh, I'll be here just to build on what you were saying a bit more too. T- I think two of the main types of loyalty we tend to face are loyalty towards people and loyalty towards what we believe is right, or integrity, as some people might say. Sometimes also there's loyalty towards institutions, for example, loyalty towards a university or a company and so forth. But let's set that aside for now. Loyalty towards what we believe is right is absolute. Uh, Or loyalty towards Allah or loyalty towards the imams because everything they do is uh, authenticated by Allah, so to speak. They only do what Allah wills. The Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, he only does uh, what Allah wills. So there's no question there. I think with loyalty with respect to people, it can get very messy because people aren't Imam Hussein. People are you and me. Well, I'm sure you're fine, but people are me. <laughs> and sometimes from one perspective where someone is sitting, 
uh, a person is being disloyal to them. Whereas on the other hand, we do have times in life when we make the choice to distance ourselves from someone because we believe it's the right thing to do. And that, that can be a very difficult thing to do. It, it can be a difficult decision. But what I'm saying is there can be multiple viewpoints. Obviously, betrayal is something else. If you promise someone something and then you, you backstab them, we understand what betrayal is, that that's wrong. Uh, but I think Ibn Ali, peace be upon him, was very um, very realistic in how he described the human condition. What was it that he said? That be careful of what you how, how much you tell your friends because they might one day become your enemy. Be careful how you treat your enemy because they might, might one day become your friend. And it, it's true. I've seen it. You've seen it. People we never imagined would be away from us, turn against us. People we never thought we would be on friendly terms with um, are t together with us. Uh, and this is the reality of the human condition. Uh, it is very changing. And as you said, people have a lot of motivations too. Um, there are some people who are insecure inside, so they want to be around someone who is not doing well. Uh, other people, they want to be around people who will model success for them. Uh, and God knows best. Again, we, we have to do our best to navigate this challenging ocean, which is life. I think an understanding of what you're saying, a deeper understanding of that is really key in choosing good friends throughout our life because obviously Islam encourages us to have friends and it's uh, it's given us many hadiths on how to choose good friends, how to treat our friends and how to some extent we should expect to be treated. And I've always found these hadiths very insightful. Mm. What, what's the most insightful one to you? What has given you the most benefit? So um, the one that, I, that really uh, has a place in my heart is um, from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, I believe, and he says that keep the friend that mm -hmm. has shouted at you and got n not shouted at you, that has gotten angry with you but hasn't spoken about you behind your back. Mm -hmm. Or another one that he has about a true friend is a mirror. He's a reflection mm -hmm. of Very you. Beautiful. And my, my interpretation of that is that a true friend is honest. They're not the person who will just come and agree with whatever you say, whether it's right or wrong, but it's the person who will point out your flaws, mm -hmm. not out of a place of arrogance, but only of a place of wanting the very best for you. Um, and I think those two hadiths go hand in hand, mm -hmm. you know, the person who is able to be honest with you, point out your flaws in order to better you, but at the same time keeps those flaws as a conversation between you and them mm -hmm. and doesn't go and spread it uh, world like worldwide or even if it's to a third party because at the end of the day protecting a fellow believer's reputation is is very important we are we're recommended and we've been instructed to protect fellow muslims Absolutely. it's also narrated that two friends are a single soul split yes. between two bodies it's so beautiful. I love that that narration because you literally have this. Um, I always imagine it as a, a literal thing where mm -hmm. you know, obviously you can have completely different personalities in some some ways and different um, ways of living your life. But sometimes you you make friends from the strangest places, and True. it's not necessarily what you expect. Mm -hmm. I think judgment has such a big thing as well to mm -hmm. do with friendships. Um, on that general topic, because. Um, even when you, for example, consider yourself, okay, me and my friend are on the same journey together in life. We have the same sort of vision. We want to accomplish the same sort of things. And even in that journey, you know, sometimes your friend will slip, you'll slip. And it's important to have somebody who's, you know, reflecting, like you're saying, honest with you in terms of even your flaws. It's, you know, we live in a society that's very, um, it's very easy to self-glamorize. It's very yeah. easy to see a sort of narcissistic version of yourself mm -hmm. and um, an image that, you know, everything is amazing and this is how we live and, you know, this is us. But in the end of the day, a friend who really, really, I think that has a big thing to do with your darkest hour. Sometimes your darkest hour is your own self. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's things inside you that you, sometimes you need to be told that, you know what, like, you know, have some perspective. Indeed, so. when it comes to the darkest hour, no one can take you through that but yourself. And of course, it's Allah, true. Yes. and so forth. But exactly. a friend or a family member can't walk that path for you. Exactly. But going back to what you said about um, your friend could become your enemy and mm. your enemy could become your friend. I feel, again, the Ahlul Bayt has prepared us for scenarios like this, again, from a hadith uh, from Imam Ali, alayhi salam, that he says, um, a fellow person is either your brother in Islam or your equal in humanity. Mm. That's encouraging us to be respectful and to see each other as equals, yes, regardless yeah. of whether we are friends or we are family or we share a religion with someone. Mm -hmm. 
again, that keeps doors open to the possible scenario of becoming friends with people you don't expect or um, not giving anything, not giving a chance for your enemies to say anything bad about you. Um, And inshallah, that's something that we can all work um, towards of being respectful to everyone and not just um, the people we see as friends. Indeed, as is narrated, Benny Adam, from the beginning of time, to the end are all like the teeth on a comb They're all exactly the same you don't see one goes up one goes down otherwise the comb wouldn't work properly an ideal comb is flat and we have the same essential inside and sometimes it takes a while to get to what's on the inside of people but we do share the same desires the same insecurities the same basic needs of course there's a lot of varieties and outward expressions some people are more practical and more Um, detail-oriented, some people are more abstract-minded, some people are more artistic, some people are more extroverted, and so on. Uh, but what happens on the inside uh, is part of the inherent human condition, and appreciating this too can also keep that door open. Yeah. I think, I think other than just focusing on finding good friends, mm-hmm. we've, we've discussed the qualities of a good friend, It's really important to work on ourselves, though, to be that good friend, something you touched on earlier. Um, and it's not always easy, is it? I think um, the beautiful example of Ahl Bayt is how as loyal as their companions were to them, they were always um, so wholesome in their presence back to their friends. You know, And for example, the story of um, Maytham al-Tamar and Imam Ali al-Islam, And he comes and he takes over his date shop for a temporary time. And, you know, and he literally treats this person. It's like the golden rule in every every religion, which is treat other people how you'd want to be treated yourself. And put yourself in other people's shoes. You know, guard people's properties like it's your own property. Guard their rights like it's your own rights. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I, I think we can't emphasize this enough to ourselves, you know, because it's very easy to slip. when it comes to that, slips in someone else's right, for example. So I think as much as um, the Ahl Bayt Laysam you see on the day of Ashura, that Imam Hussein Laysam's companions were loyal to, you know, without any any sort of limit to their loyalty. Okay. Everything they had, they, they gave for him. But similarly, the way that he showed that generosity back to them and he showed his love back to them, it's something which we can only, you know, dream of to have that. And... It really takes a person, like you said, of integrity to be able to be that friend and also have the heart to return it. And I think other than just returning uh, the generosity of his friends, Imam Hussein, on, uh, on the day of Ashura, going back to the story of John, um, he didn't just return it, but in many ways he showed us that he didn't expect it. Mm. Um, at the end of that story, for it's example, yeah. Yeah, at yeah, the end of that story, um, Imam Hussein told him, Yeah, and he recommended, like you said, for him to leave. Um, it means, I think it goes to show that he didn't expect it. Mm, of um, course. Yeah, he, mm. he could understand if a friend chose not to go through yes. the foreseeable hardships that were about to take place. Yeah. But um, the, the, the reply of John is absolutely beautiful in which he says, well, that wouldn't be fair for me to have... Um, accompanied you throughout um, you know your journey and uh, taken advantage of your generosity and now for me to leave you in your time of need yeah. I think that's a great story that we can learn a lot from Alhamdulillah. indeed selflessness is attractive and selfishness is not attractive uh, when it comes to Ahlbayt peace be upon them they all embodied selflessness which is one of the reasons we still remember them So yeah. beautiful. I think when we talk about loyalty, though, you have to mention his name. Like everyone thinks of Abu Fab and Hazrat Abbas Islam, and everybody has. I mean, I think everybody I've met has some sort of relationship with to him because of that loyalty he showed in in that darkest hour. So um, I don't know. I think he he deserves an entire episode for his own name Inshallah. because of the qualities that he embodied. And I think one of the most beautiful things about him is how he. You know, people talk about him like he was just the brother of Imam Hussein and that was his identity. Not like he had this sort of self, um, this worth which was beyond an army of a thousand men and not because of the, the status of a warrior, but because of what he perfected inside himself. The knowledge he embodied himself, the vision, you know, the eyesight that he had that yeah. was beyond, a, you know, any scholar we can dream of. And I just think that that level of humility in 
in that loyalty, in that moment of loyalty, just showing like he's nothing in that in that path of truth. It's just something that you think someone so great has that ability to do, you know, beyond what we can dream of. So I think Inshallah. it's really hard to have a conversation like this without, for me, without mentioning his name. But Absolutely. And it's another very beautiful answer of selflessness as well. So true. Yeah. Yeah. We have a lot to learn and a lot to work on in our Inshallah. Selves. Everything step by step in life. Life teaches us. Yeah, and the people around us also teach us. So John's story isn't the only um, Islamic friendship we could say or event that um, we've been given. We've been blessed with uh, many scenarios and many different um, narrations and events that can help us in understanding loyalty and friendship. Um, which ones do you think have um, have a special place in your heart? Um, I think right from the beginning of the Holy Prophet peace upon his mission, one of the first things that was established was brotherhood um, because of the conversations he had with his family members, um, people around him, members of the Quraysh clan, members of Bani Hashim, and this idea of who is going to succeed me. Succession through such a difficult journey that he had to endure and the idea of somebody taking on the difficulties that he took on and somebody protecting him and nurturing that relationship of people between their religion and him and ensuring that it's smooth for him. That was a momentous task that I don't think anybody can ever underestimate what those initial companions of the Holy Prophet peace him went through. And above all, I think we've just you know, celebrated Eid al And obviously when someone thinks loyalty and brotherhood, they think of yeah, they think of Hazrat Abbas sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but who was his father? And where did he learn how to protect the eyes of his religion? It's, it was through his own father. It's the loyalty he had to the Holy Prophet peace be And not, again, not because they were just brothers, not because of a cousin relationship, not because of clans or tribes, but because it was something that was symbolic of the truth. It was because from the day he was born, that man was born with a mission to protect and to have that loyalty is embodied, is in, you know, inbred within you know the milk that he drank from his mother it's something that he was raised with so Amir al-Mu'manin salam is I think the biggest example that anyone from almost any religion can look at and think why would someone at 11 years old have the insight and the wisdom to know that that journey was difficult and yet no matter what circumstances faced him faced Sayyid Fatima and faced Sayyid Khadija faced Abu Talib Based the mother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, these people are gems that you think because of what we have today is because of them. So I think when we look at examples of Ahlul Bayt, the reason why people light up with so much love and you know so much happiness on Eid al-Adir and so much sadness in Muharram is because you know these personalities were the most beautiful embodiment of loyalty that there ever was. And to mourn it, to celebrate it, is because it taps into such a vulnerable human emotion that we all carry inside ourselves. And knowing that they are there still, their loyalty is still there, that their protection is still there, it's something which carries you through, you know, through your difficulties and things. So I think Amir Mu'mineen, I mean, again, it's not something that you can even underestimate what his qualities were. And that's just, you know, Mashallah. my humble <laughs> opinion on that. Yeah. Yes, Imam Ali suffered a lot too. We focus a lot about on his early years and his time when he formally held the Khilafah, but there was a long time where he had to keep a lot of things on the inside, and I think a lot of us can relate to that as well. Um, how do you think the example given to us by uh, the Holy Prophet and his household, peace be upon them, differs from the examples that we had as uh, that we had from leaders pre-islam i think it's a very general question i mean i i'm a bit uh not up to date on my anthropology people have been around for what twenty thousand, thirty thousand years something <laughs> like that maybe it's more than that maybe that's recorded history that i'm thinking of the, the point is there have been a lot of societies, a lot of leaders, a lot of different ways of living, most of which we have no memory of whatsoever. I mean, you know, you read sometimes ancient Greek books, for example, and they talk about the peoples who have passed and the variety of things that have happened that we really know nothing about. So we can't really divide society that easily and say everything was the same before Islam. There were good leaders, there were bad leaders. Even the Holy Quran, there's people whom Allah praises in the Holy Quran in the past, there's people whom Allah contend, if condemns. So... 
Uh, and Hamza, we know the Holy Prophet وسلم, has a, a fundamental role. He had a fundamental role in the future of the world as the bringer of the finer, final revelation. And we believe he has a creational role as well, being uh, the foremost of Allah's creation and having a, you know, a, a close relationship with things uh, at a higher spiritual level and not only just giving a, a book of law or something, but also being connected in some way to the cosmos. So this, of course, is something which is different. But again, those who came before him, and by that I mean the prophets, and maybe even some people had wisdom and so forth, acknowledged him and acknowledged Imam Ali, acknowledged, acknowledged Hazrat Fatima, acknowledged Imam Hussein, the prophets who came before, wept for Imam Hussein. Uh, they did things sometimes uh, in remembrance of Imam Hussein. So uh, I think one thing we do actually we can take is when it comes to the Holy Prophet وسلم, or Imam Hussein or Imam Ali or Hazrat Fatima, I, I do feel there's actually a, a creational continuity. These pe are people who were important in the very beginning of human existence. When it comes, for example, to Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, we know that among the ways that they besieged Allah for uh, Allah's mercy after eating from the fruit they should not have eaten from is through the names of Muhammad Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein, and they'll be there also on the Qiyamah. I think um, it's very unique as well to Islam, um, events like Mabahila, um, events like the day where there's such a public declaration of um, that mutual sort of loyalty. And like some people, I think when they speak about Imam Hussein they say Mabahila, like he was, I mean, I'm not sure what exact age, but he was so young, right? And it just shows that sometimes in our minds, I think Allah almost gives us these examples so that we can picture it, that this idea of you know, this loyalty, it's, it, was a li it wasn't a lifetime thing. I mean, it was beyond what time we can describe, you know. Inshallah. And it's from, like you said, Adam and Eve, from before even the creation of this world, there was this light that Allah created, and from that light came the light. And you think we, I think it's these um, universal truths that we keep mentioning, it goes, I think it's so important to remember, it goes way beyond our own existence, and you know, a way after it. And I think just with the example of Ahlul Bayt is that it was just... So beautiful, so heartwarming, so personal, and so um, interpersonal in so many ways that it's something that everyone, no matter where you are, you relate to, you know? And um, yeah, so I think these events like Ghadir, like the companions of Imam, of Imam Ali Islam, even who, Nathan Atamar, who had his tongue chopped off and out of his body, knowing that was going to happen to him, it's this, this foresight that Ahl Bayt had, or that even their companions had about what was going to happen, and the endurance through that still, um, which really stands up to me, I think. Yeah. Also, with respect to Mubahala, uh, although sometimes it's a challenge to draw lessons from people who are in the position of Ahl Bayt, peace be upon them, just because they're not ordinary people, nonetheless, it does show the, the value and importance of children. I think in this day and age, we tend to underestimate children and their ability to take a stand, their ability to make a commitment, their ability to understand, their ability to understand Allah also. Uh, and yet, we find throughout history, children do demonstrate, they come into this world, they have a complete soul. I mean, they may obviously still be maturing, obviously there is, you know, you don't expect the same things from a two-year-old that you do from a 12-year-old. But nonetheless, nonetheless, young people, they don't need to be made more juvenile than they are. And the fact that they can participate, if you will, in the activities of adults, uh, diplomatic activities, if it were, and actually uh, have this stance be meaningful is something that I think we can take a lesson from in this day and age, where in this day and age, sometimes we talk about 17-year-olds as if they're children. Yeah, uh, whereas so we're not, we're, we're souls before Allah. Yeah. We're, we're growing souls. And incidentally, we continue to grow after 17 too. Yeah. Uh, but what I mean is um, there is a, a spiritual maturity in the human being. Yeah. Especially if you believe in the hadith of al Mudar and the pre-creation of the human soul for thousands of years before it comes here. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with, um, going back to the question that I asked previously, I agree that um, we've had so many leaders before Islam and so many leaders throughout Islam and uh, till now that it's hard to give a very direct generalized answer regarding the differences. But the point I was trying to get to is I see a very clear united message throughout the beginning of Islam till now, which was which was many things, but a big one for me is loyalty, mm -hmm. is uh, brotherhood, is um, being trustworthy. That's um, the message that, for me, really stands out with looking into Islam, because I feel like, yes, we had some great examples pre-Islam, 
we had some bad examples and again after Islam but throughout Islam throughout the Ahlul Bayt I feel like we've seen it pass on through every single member of the holy household um, thank you so much for being here today uh, once again I um, benefited a lot from both your expertise and your knowledge thank you for coming and I hope to see you again very soon thank you so much